This morning we have a guest speaker. His name is Ray Santani, and Ray is, is uh, one of the teaching elders up at Highlands Christian Fellowship in Calistoga, and a longtime Napa resident, and a lot of you guys know him. Uh, was it 15 years ago about that Rock started? This will be 14. So this year is the 14th year. Uh, Ray has always had a heart for evangelism and for youth, and about 14 years ago, they started a little outreach at the old glider port up there for kids. And the thing has grown and grown and grown, and probably averaging 10 to 15,000 people per year now. This is a huge event, ev evangelical Christian festival, music, preaching, teaching, a number of things. It's up in Calistoga at the fairgrounds, and uh, we're happy to have Ray here. He's going to be sharing with us about the event and also about prayer and about evangelism. And so glad to have you, Ray. Come on up. multifaceted speaker. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, yeah, my name is Ray, and um, my friends call me Ray. And <laughs> um, yeah, Rock of Ages uh, started, uh, yeah, this will be our 14th year. And uh, a lot of people, most of you people have been to it probably, right? How many people have been to it? And I know Gordon this year is uh, doing a fantastic job getting uh, the children's ministry. We have sports ministry, children's ministry. We have workshops. We have workshops in, in creation science, in um, how to build a strong worship team for small churches. We have a workshop also in human trafficking that's really mind-blowing. Uh, but we also have just a lot of great things going on with the sports ministry and children's ministry. A lot of you people, if you want to be involved, you can probably talk to Gordon and uh, he can get you set up to help with the children's ministry in any way you want. This year we're doing it for free. And uh, the big question always is, why? Because we always go in debt every year. And um, the thing is that every year we've kind of seen that we get a lot of people coming and, you know, 500 to 1,000 people get saved every year. And that's, and we're not about numbers, but it's just praise God for that. Um, but we just had a heart this year and prayed a lot about how do we get this to be not just an event where Christians just come and have a great day and hopefully some non-believers come. Uh, we're all about making this year a year that we make it really easy for everybody to come and bring non-believers. We'll talk at the end a little bit, but on the table outside, there's posters and cars. There's also free passes we're giving out this year. So you can take a bunch of those and actually give them to non-believing friends and bring them with you. Um, we'll have a counselor training also uh, here on the 25th, uh, not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday. We'll talk more about the end too. And we want all of you guys to be there for that too. We want to really get a lot of people to know Jesus Christ, uh, maybe for the first time in their lives, to have lives changed and uh, them to be f discipled by churches. And so we really want to get them into your churches uh, to really develop that. Um, this morning we're going to talk about prayer um, because that has a great thing to do with uh, all the things that we've been called to do. Rock of Ages Now also has been called, uh, me particularly, uh, to help other evangelists uh, all over the world. And it's really been a huge blessing. This year I've been to India uh, with Brad Butcher, you probably know him. I've been helping him going next year also, doing a lot of great outreach festivals over there. Um, been to Honduras and uh, also to Kenya. They've asked us to do a big festival over there to reach, uh, work with 150 churches. Uh, to reach out to the people over there. So it's been a huge blessing um, to see how God's been using the equipping of this f uh, festival to help other festivals and evangelists all around the world uh, to reach thousands and thousands of people for Christ. We'll talk about that in a little while too. Uh, but today I want to talk about prayer. Let's, uh, I think a good thing to do before we talk about prayer is to pray. <laughs> so let's do that. Father, we just thank you so much for being able to talk to you, being able to have a relationship with you. It's just mind-blowing that we can even know you. Uh, what a privilege that is, and you've made it possible because of your sacrifice of your son, uh, so we can have an easy access to you at all times, 24-7. Uh, so we ask, Father, that you just uh, delve us into your word so we might see um, what your word says about how to talk to you, how to relate to you, how to, how to plead with you, how to cry out to you, how to be ones that are your children, that you love so much that uh, we just want to walk side by side with you, Lord. So we, uh, we thank you for your word and how you can inspire us to be closer to you. And we thank you for all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the effective prayer of a righteous man can availeth much. That's the King James Version, availeth. I don't know, nobody uses that word anymore, availeth, right? Uh, can accomplish a lot. Um, 
And we're going to talk about that this morning, about what prayer has to do with evangelism, what prayer has to do with us reaching out to God, what prayer has to do with us reaching people for Christ. And um, start out, we have a picture up here of, uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, we started Rock of Ages a long time ago because I was a youth pastor up in Highlands. And I was a youth pastor for about at least 25 years. We're trying to figure out what that was, but I know I'm only 39, so I don't know how I really was a youth pastor for 25 years, but I was. Uh, but if you notice, this was, uh, we used to do mission trips to Mexico every year with our youth group. And if you look uh, on the, yeah, the left-hand side, on about two-thirds way back, there's a girl with a white t-shirt on. And her name is Andrea. And uh, we used to have a rule in our youth group where you can become part of our youth group if you're uh, going into seventh grade or, or sen through senior high school, you know. So once you get into seventh grade and graduate high school. That's the years that we have our youth group. And so um, it was a pretty thriving youth group. We did a lot of events, a lot of great things, a lot of Bible studies, a lot of stuff. And it was pretty popular. A lot of people in town wanted to come. It was great. Well, Andrea, uh, she was not content when she graduated from sixth grade. She was going to have to wait till the fall because that's when she was going into seventh grade to become part of youth group. Well, that didn't sit well with Andrea. She wanted to be in youth group. She wanted to really go to that. So what she did, and she was a smart young lady, uh, she got a petition, and she took this petition to all the people in our church. She was really smart because she went to my wife, Marge, first. <laughs> and so she had Marge sign the petition. I actually found it the other day and gave it to her mom to remind her. She's now, what, she's married in Texas, uh, pregnant and having a kid, and she's doing ministry down there. Uh, but anyway, she wanted desperately to be in, so she had everybody in our church sign this petition because she really wanted to be in youth group. And what are you going to do with that? You know, okay, Andrea, you're, you're in. I mean, everybody in the church wants you in, and you're pleading the case so much. And it reminded me of the scripture, the next one about prayer changes things. In Luke 18, 2 through 14, it says, In a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while, he was unwilling, but afterwards he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this, window, this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him every day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This story always kind of bugged me a little bit. I'm going, what, what is he talking about? This unrighteous judge. But this, to me, the whole point of the story is this woman was constantly, constantly pestering this judge. And I think what God is saying here, he's equating faith with us relating and talking and pleading with God. How often do we just pray? And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit, all the ramifications of what we think about prayer. When we pray, do we clamor for God? Do we cry out to God? Are we a pest to God? Do we, like, plead with Him moment by moment through our lifetimes and stuff? Is this something that's the cry of our heart? Because God is a God, it's a miracle that, like I said before, we even know Him. Marge and I were at uh, the aquarium a couple, what, three, four weeks ago? And sometimes you go to the aquarium in Monterey. How many people have been to the aquarium in Monterey? It's a beautiful, beautiful aquarium. But you, you walk around, and, and to me it's incredible. You see all these fish and these aquatic things that man usually doesn't even see, and they're colorful, beautiful, artistically done and designed. And you think God is just such a creative, loving God. And we saw these jellyfish, and they have an incredible jellyfish exhibit down there, but these these delicate little creatures with membranes, with these tentacles, they're just, I'm a glass artist by trade, and so I love art, and you're looking at all these beautiful things that God made, and they, they can bump into each other and know to turn around, and where is their brain? I don't see anything. It's just this incredible design creature. And then sometimes you look out in the stars in the sky, and I sometimes think about when you talk in the Old Testament about the burning bush, how can a bush just keep burning and not burn out? And you look in the stars in the sky, and those are balls of rock that are burning and not burning out. I mean, God is a God who is just incredible, the things he made. And we have access to him. We can talk to him. We can plead with him. And he responds to us. I mean, that's to me what the Scripture is all about. 
I think as God is telling us, do we have enough faith to just cry out to God with our heart, plead with them? I know a lot of times I've heard people say, well, there's some things I just don't tell God. That's kind of dumb, isn't it? I mean, God knows everything. What are we hiding from God? Are we emotional people that really cry out for things? Do we want people to get saved? Do we want healing in our lives, healing in our marriages? His word to be spread throughout our land, the world, people to get to know him. Are those cries of our heart? And I think this is what this is pointing to. God wants us to have this this deep down gut-wrenching thing. God, please respond to my cry. Heal, save all the things that God desires intensely to do. This is another scripture that came to mind. We were ministering in Arizona not too long ago with our church. We went down to the, the Navajo Nation. And, um, and it also reminded us in Honduras, we were doing there some medical, medical mission work down there uh, with another evangelistic team that we're working with. And this, this came to mind because we were doing a lot of medical work and, and, and uh, seeing people get healed and praying for people. And, um, and this, this scripture came to my mind while I was down there because it talks a lot about also our role in prayer for other people. It says, when he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. Talking about Jesus. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room. The place was packed. Everybody wanted to see Jesus. Not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. So here's Jesus in this home. People, they're thronging to see him. I mean, he's a man who was doing miracles and healings and all kinds of stuff and teaching truth that people could not uh, put aside the fact that it was truth, different than any other man on earth ever spoke. And so the whole place was like jam-packed. He says, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. But being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was laying. Can you imagine being in this home and they had tile roofs in those days and, and whether this was a tile roof or not, they actually had to dig a hole in the roof because they really desired so much to get their friend down to see Jesus. He was a paralytic on a pallet and they, were, they wanted desperately to be, for him to be there. And so being able to, uh, they removed the roof and, and laid down the pallet and it says, and Jesus... Seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. When we're in Honduras, I'm, I'm looking at all these people coming to us, and I'll talk about, that, about what that was like in a minute and show you some pictures. People are coming in droves wanting to be healed of these illnesses that they have. In Honduras, there's a lot of health problems. But I'm thinking about this and saying, these people wanted so much for their friend to be healed so much to see Jesus that they dug a hole in a roof to lie him down there. And Jesus says to the paralytic guy, because of your friend's faith, your sins are forgiven. I mean, that blows my mind. How much faith do we have for our friends? And not just for physical healings, but salvation. I mean, this to me is a really pretty heavy kind of statement on Jesus' part. Because of your friend's faith? How much faith do we have for our friends, for our brothers and sisters in the Lord, for our non-believing friends, for people around us that we want to just hunger, like we said, clamor to God, bringing them to know Jesus? I mean, that's part of what we're all about. So, go to the next slide. This is Honduras. And uh, we went down there. um, Reed Saunders is going to be our gospel presenter this year at Rock of Ages. And uh, he's an evangelist through the Palau Ministries that we're working a lot with. And he's been to hundreds and hundreds of countries. He's a young guy from Petaluma. But what a heart to just proclaim Jesus to the world. He's just an amazing young guy. And uh, we're helping him out. Uh, Next year we're going with him to Macedonia and Ethiopia in November and a bunch of places, Thailand. And But we went with him on this trip to to Honduras. And Honduras is a pretty poor country. I mean, it's, it's pretty poor. I mean, I went to Africa, and they're poor, but they're living a nice life. Honduras, they're poor, and they're living a horrible life. And, uh, and through these slides, uh, the next slide is a, a slide of, of this uh, group that's going to be at Rock of Ages, too, actually. They're going to be help uh, Gordon with the children's ministry. It's called Kid Stand. And uh, we go down there. We went down to Honduras, and, and there's all these problems down there. So we go and preach the gospel, had a festival a couple nights, 
and had medical clinics, and, um, and we took KidStand to do ministry for these kids. And so they do an incredible job, really enthusiastic, great, proclaim the gospel in kids' language, parents' languages, and, and uh, they're doing a great job. And here they also do the skit. And, um, and actually they said if Sunday morning you wanted them to come here, they can, they can come here. Uh, they do the skit, and it's kind of a pantomime thing about Jesus saving people from the sins of the world. And it's really a, a gripping, gripping drama. It's, it's incredible. But we do that for all the parents and the kids that are there. But then the, the parents, the next slide, the parents are all standing in line, uh, and some of the kids too, because they have a lot of health problems down there. I mean, the water's bad. So, I mean, Marge came with me, and she kind of helped and stuff, and she can attest that most everybody that came there had stomach problems. I mean, they have great diseases and stuff going on there, AIDS, all kinds of, all kinds of really nasty stuff, but a lot of water and health problems with sicknesses and stomach ailments and stuff. So all these people would come and, and stand in line because uh, we had a medical team of a bunch of uh, doctors and nurses. Well, they were all nurses, actually. Uh, a guy and a bunch of ladies, and, and they were doing screenings for all these people. And the next slide is showing uh, this one guy, uh, one of the, the, the nurses that was, would talk to these people and find out what their ailments were, what they needed, because we had a, a small pharmacy, and they can get um, medications and things like that to help them out. So, th so they would take care of these needs. And, um, and this was, I forgot her name, actually. But uh, in the next slide, she was dispensing medications and stuff. But before they can go get medications, um, we'd ask if they want to come and be diverted to our prayer team. And so I and a couple of the people, uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, I and a couple of the people would have these little plastic chairs, whatever you could find around, because uh, all the places we did these medical clinics for several days. I did a pastor's conference one day, and for the next two days, we did these medical clinics, and I was with them. And so there was, there was three or four of us praying with people, because uh, Marge would be the facilitator, and she'd divert people. Before they come to the pharmacy, after they saw the doctors and nurses, they would come to people and ask if there was any prayer. And, and I kind of realized that while we were sitting there praying for people, that that there is a mediator between us and God, and they need to be aware of this. Some of the, some of the people said they were Christians and some didn't. Uh, but in 1 Timothy 2.5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. And so I realized, as we all do when you're praying for somebody, that it's, a, it's an incredible privilege to pray for people, especially with them, about things of great need in their lives. And, and when, while doing this, you realize that what you're doing is actually putting them in touch with God while you're talking to them, that we are ambassadors. We are salt and light to the world. We're the ones that are bringing God's light into their darkened lives. And these people had dark lives. I mean, the stuff they would go through would be incredible. Um, we would talk to these people about these huge needs that they would have. I mean, girls being raped by their fathers. I mean men who would leave their wives and the kids not knowing who their dad was anymore. I mean, just people with accents. They said, uh, we asked them what the, the average age um, life expectancy was in Honduras. And one of the guys said, well, about 40. I said, why, because of illness and stuff? He says, no. He said, shooting. There's so many gangs down there, so many drug cartels and stuff, people get shot like crazy down there. So they have a huge, evil, nasty, dark situation they're living in. So when you're praying for people like that, you know, sometimes we pray lightly. I mean, good, but sometimes you, with people like this, the need is so huge in front of you that all of a sudden you see these hearts crying out, and most of them don't know what they're crying out to or for. And so the next slide is, um, is our, our medical team. And so we're sitting there, and, uh, and we went around praying. Is that the next slide? Okay, well, that's, that's good. Uh, we, would, we would go into people's homes and at the medical clinics, and we would pray with people. And we would see their situations. I mean, this right here, oh, you go to the next one. Um, this is like this lady's home, and it's not much bigger than what you see. There's in this barrio, and there's just these tiny little areas, and there's not much going on there. I mean, it's so dark and so dirty, but they're, they're sweeping out. They're trying to keep things clean. But their lifestyle is just incredible, and we would bring them dresses and, uh, and, and clothes for the, for the young boys and stuff, and they would just, oh, man, they would just clamor for anything that you can give them. And, but we'd sit there and pray for, for all their needs. The next slide shows us praying, um, and uh, we had, like I said, several people, and, and people would come with their kids, and 
with all kinds of things going on physically in their lives and stuff. And so uh, we had a whole team. The next picture shows a, a young uh, man, I think it was from Texas, a pastor who came with us too, and he was part of our prayer team too. And uh, the next one too, people praying. We had some of the skaters even praying with us and stuff because all these people kept coming to us. And, and after a while, one of, the, one of the nurses said, she said, he said, um, you know, we spent a lot of time healing and trying to heal, at least for the short term, some of these medical needs. But the biggest need they have is for prayer. Prayer in their lives for all the things that are going on in their lives. <clears throat> and then I realized more and more as we were praying with these people, because we'd, we'd have them sit down and, and we'd say, well, what's, what's wrong with you physically and stuff? And what can we pray for you about? And they'd say, well, stomach thing or this or my husband's out of work because he got run over by a car. Or, I mean, all kinds of physical problems going on and financial problems. But then I realized this. In the next slide, it talks about why we should pray or who should pray. Because it says, and the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up as he has committed. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. So prayer first is we could go to God for healing. Soul, body, mind, spirit, we can go to God for healing. He's one who created us. He's one that can touch us. He can, that could put us back together again. But it says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you might be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. So we're praying with all these people, realizing there are huge physical needs. There are huge social needs. I mean, things that we pray for each other about a lot. But then, I kept realizing as I prayed for these people, there was something deeper that they needed to know about. And I hope this is on all of our hearts whenever we're praying for people. Uh, the next one is Romans 10.1. It says, Brother, in my heart's desire, my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. <sighs> Rejoicing in hope, preserving in tribulation, devoted in prayer. We should be totally devoted to praying for people for their healing, yes, for their social needs, yes, for their marriages, for all the things going on in their lives. But the deepest need is for them to be saved, them to know the eternal promise of being with God and not going to hell and having a relationship with God 24-7 despite what's going on in their lives. I would be praying with some of these people, and the next slide is me praying with this young man, and, and these people would come up with all these needs, and I'd slowly be talking to him about what their physical needs, why they're here, praying for that. But then I'd start going a little bit deeper. What's going on in your life right now? What do you need prayer for right now in your marriage or in your family? And do you know Jesus? And a lot of the people would say, well, yeah, we, we go to this church over here, you know. But down there, there's a lot of churches that are springing up, but they don't, a lot of the pastors aren't trained well, and a lot of them don't know the gospel very much. And so I'd ask them about if they really had a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the response was really kind of really mixed. Some people would say yes, and they'd break down and cry because we would talk about their spiritual lives and heal that before we even talk about their ailments and their stomach problems and things like that. And remember there was one guy that came and he sat down, really nice guy, and he had some leg problems and some things. I said, well, you know, are you a Christian? And he says, oh, yeah. I said, well, and I just looked at him, and I, sometimes you feel God prompting you to say things, and I said, well, what does that mean to you? And he just looked at me and he said, you got me there. I said, do you know what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, what Jesus Christ did for you? He said, I'm really not quite sure. And we started talking about salvation and about Jesus dying to cover his sin, paying the price, being redeemed and what that means to be part of the family of God for eternity, being in God's presence so you can talk to him all the time, feeling the confidence of salvation. We kept talking about all these things, and he just started weeping. And a lot of people we talked to, the next one you'll see too is a slide, because we, we talked a lot about the prayer team. These people need to know salvation deeper than anything. The medications we give could last for a little while, could heal their stomachs for a while, but we all knew that if they keep drinking that bad water, they're going to keep getting it, you know. So we needed to really delve into their spiritual lives and what they were all about. And people would just cry out. And 
Sometimes it would break my heart when you see people just cry out to God and accept him. Just for the two days I was with some, and we prayed for about 100 people a day would come to these clinics and stuff. And just people I pray with, we had 15 people except Jesus Christ, their Savior, in those two days, just with me. And these other people had many too. Because people needed to know Jesus. People needed to know salvation. And sometimes you'd pray for these people and you'd physically see this darkness being lifted off them. You'd see just this oppression of their life spiritually just be off. And it just would blow my mind. I'd be crying with them. Because the joy of salvation and knowing eternal life with Jesus Christ was just so huge. And that should be the cry of our hearts, shouldn't it? Crying to God for our friends. Having faith enough to bring our friends to know Jesus. Being that heartfelt about it. Realizing the price Jesus paid. And the great gift of eternal life, what that really means. Sometimes I think in America we take it for granted. You go to foreign, that's why I love now traveling. You go to these foreign countries and you see what it really means to some of these people. Here a lot of times I think we go around and, and people get saved and go, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to go to church a couple times. And I mean, the depth of reality of what salvation is all about is incredible. And it can change a lot of things. The next slide is Luke 1.13. It says, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will, give, you will name him John. And, you know, you realize sometimes you pray for things, and it's not just about that person, but it's what God will do with that person then? I mean, sometimes we want to get people saved, yes. But man, it's, it's, so God has more people in the kingdom to work with here on earth. I've shared a story before about Edward Kimball, and you might have heard of it before about how, how sometimes you, you get somebody to know Jesus and then they share it with somebody and they share it with somebody and they share it with somebody and how all of a sudden thousands of people throughout the world get saved because of this person that knew the gospel, that shared with another person knowing the gospel. And there was a guy down there and his name is Hernan. This is Hernan. Next slide. And Hernan was my translator at the, these men's um, pastor's conferences we were doing. Uh, they end up at the last minute saying, Ray, you're doing the whole pastor's conference all day. <laughs> and it was kind of cool because we were talking about family and all kinds of things and about uh, being godly pastors and leaders and things like that. But this guy, Hernan, he became a Christian uh, not too many years before. And um, he was just a regular guy in Honduras with a lot of weird stuff going on in his life. And he found Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And now he, um, he joined a church and uh, he said, it was a good church. He said, but I, reached, I, really, I wanted to reach the deep lost around here. And so he opened up his garage and started a, a fellowship. Uh, and he had like, within a couple months, he had like 50 people coming. But they were all the local prostitutes and the drug dealers and all these people. He would just go and get the, the downtrodden around him, and they would come. And he showed me a video clip of this story about this guy who would come around the neighborhood, and he was just like a drunken mess. And just slobbering all over, just, I mean, the worst of the worst kind of alcoholics on the street, street guy. And he would constantly try to share Jesus with him a little bit. And the guy's, I don't know, any of that, you know. And, uh, but every week, he'd kind of come around, and he'd share with them and share with them a little bit. And um, after about six months, all of a sudden, he didn't, Hernan didn't see this guy anymore. And the guy was gone. He didn't know what happened. He said, I kept praying for him. I don't know what happened to him. And about six months later, all of a sudden, this guy knocked at his door. And uh, he thought he was a salesman or something. He was clean cut, had a suit on, shaven. I mean, nice looking man. Turns out this was the guy that he had been witnessing to for six months. And the guy said, yeah, I got so down and out and I left the area and I started crying and realized all the things you told me about Jesus, I needed him as my savior. And I accepted him as my Lord and savior. And now I want you to help disciple me, get me strong. And so he's now part of his church. He's, he's now one of the Bible teachers there because over the past year, he's trained him and taught him scripture and everything, and now he teaches Bible, and now they're trying to find a bigger garage because they're exploding. And, uh, and praise God for that. I mean, that you can pray for somebody's salvation, and they can pray for somebody else, and how that will spread and change, and change God's kingdom. The next one is Luke 18, 9 through 14. And I... Because a lot of times I think we have to think about how not to pray. 
you know, I've had a lot of people, and we know a lot of people have formula prayers and things like that. There's, there's things we do and repetitious prayers just to make a habit of something. But praying is this incredible relationship with God, with our Father, our Savior. And here it says, he also told a parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector here. Who hates tax collectors here? Actually, I'm being audited right now, but, but it's by a Christian guy who's a Christian rapper, which is, blows my mind. Anyways, that's beside the point. Um, it says, the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Swindlers, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. And this guy was proud of himself. This guy was doing good. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to the house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. How do we go to God? Are we religious? Do we say like formula prayers and, I mean, God wants to hear our cry. God wants to hear our heart. God wants to hear our humility because of the gift he gave, the sacrifice he gave. We can never take that for granted. I knew a guy when I first became a Christian, I was part of this ministry that got way off, so I won't even tell you the name of it because I left them right away. But there was this guy who used to come to our prayer meetings all the time and he would start praying and he almost didn't want this guy to come anymore. Because he would start praying, and he would pray for basic needs at first, but then he'd start praying for molecules in the carpet, and he would pray for like an hour. And yet, after a while, you realize this guy just wanted to talk and be known around the people. He, he wasn't talking to God. He was just talking. And it really was kind of disconcerting a little bit hearing this guy. He wasn't talking to God at all. As opposed to when we've, we used to take our youth group to this place in Virginia City, and I forgot the name of it now, it was the, the ski camp in the... And they had Bible studies. They had a lot of problem kids there and stuff they were taking care of. It was a ranch. I forgot the name of it. Uh, but they would take care of all these kids. And, uh, and on Sunday morning, we go to their, their prayer time and, and service time. And the kid, I don't know, Leah, I don't know if you ever went to that when my daughter's here too. But we took all the kids there and, um, and they got together and they said, well, first, you know, first before we start our service time, we have a little time of prayer. And they were so known for their praying that people in the community would just come for prayer because they knew that these people prayed to God about deep needs in life. And so the place we packed with people, church people, these kids, the problem kids they're ministering to, and all these people from town, and their prayer time lasted like an hour. And they're just praying their heart out. I mean, it's just you're in tears. You're just listening to these prayers to God and, and God answering prayers and people praising God for how answered prayer from the last week came about and all these things. Then they would have a service time, and that was an hour and a half. And then they'd say, well, now we're going to get together uh, for a worship time, and the kids can go now for another hour. And so the teens went away for like an hour while the adults did other stuff. And then they would come back together. And it was like all day, all day service. It was like all day church. And they kept saying, well, our kids were always complaining. So, this is pretty long. And they said, what else can you do with your day? Be with God, talking to God, praying for God, pleading with God. This is what we do as believers. And I think that's what this is talking about. Are we just religious? Because there's several things about prayer we can talk about really quick. And one is the Lord's. We always call the Lord's Prayer. Everybody knows the Lord's Prayer? In Matthew 6, 9. Can we all say it together? Not for repetitious, I mean, repetitious prayer, but it's this neat thing that Jesus taught the disciples how to pray. Right? Can we all say it? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses and those who trespasses us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Now that's, that's an incredible prayer. Yeah, that end, it's in parentheses in the Bible so it, that's not really in there and so it makes a great song. But, but it's a great prayer. These are things we should know to pray about. But it's not what I call the Lord's Prayer. This is the disciples' prayer, I, I call it. The Lord's Prayer is actually in John 17. And if you have a Bible, I don't have it up here. I want you to use your Bibles at times. So, 
If you look to John 17, and I'll just read part of this, it's uh, John 17, verse 6 through 21, and I'll read through it, you can read along. Because to me, this is the Lord's Prayer. This is a prayer that Jesus prayed to his Father. And if you want to see the depth of what Jesus is talking about to his dad before he died, this to me is pretty enlightening. It says, I have manifested, and, and look how many times pronouns are used. And, let, and we'll talk a little about what those pronouns are referring to. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me. Out of the world, they were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Who are they talking about? Who's Jesus talking about? His disciples, his followers. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them, and they received them, and truly understood that it came forth from you, and they believe that you sent me. I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. I mean, what's he talking about so far? He's praying for his followers, for the believers. He's praying for people that he's discipling. He says, I am no longer in the world, yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, and they will be one even as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so the scripture might be fulfilled. We know who that is. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they might have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I have not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. Notice how he's, all he's talking about is these people he's teaching. All he's praying to God about are these followers of the gospel, of the truth. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. And you sent me to the world. I have also sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also might be sanctified in the truth. I mean, this is a great Bible study. If you go through this, what he's praying for the followers are incredible. But this part is really the amazing part. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, not just these followers I'm teaching, but for those also who believe in me through their word. He's praying for us. Jesus is praying for us, for all those who received the word ever since the disciples were on this planet. He's praying for us, that they might all be one, one body, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that, and that's my favorite new term in the Bible, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Our whole role here that Jesus prayed for is that everybody, through seeing us in our life and our testimony, that they start knowing the truth. That's what Jesus is praying for us, that we the ambassadors, that we're the ones that show people what salvation is all about. The next one is, uh, and I'll skip because we're running short on time, 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Do we beg people? Do we plead with God? I love how God in his word gets to the depth of things. It's not just lighthearted, well, I hope they get to know me. I mean, God's pleading for us. Jesus is pleading for other people. Because we now, the next slide is 2 Corinthians 5.18, now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus and gave the ministry of reconciliation. That's our ministry. That's our ministry to reconcile people to God. Right? We're not here to be selfish. We've got to freely give to people. Uh, we'll skip the next one. Um, two more is Ephesians 6.18. If we can go to that real quick. We'll get close to ending here. Um, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all preservation and petition for all the saints. So we should be praying for each other. But also in 1 Timothy 2, 1, it says, First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men. So we need to pray for each other for strength, but also for all men that they get to know Jesus Christ. 
The next slide, really quick, just I'll, I'll kind of close with this and one other story. Sorry. Uh, this is the team in Africa that asked me in Kenya to come and see them to do an outreach. We're going to be working there for a year, training their pastors, training their bishops, over 150 churches, how to know the gospel, be convinced of salvation, how to understand, how to teach that and share it, uh, how to be uh, counselors at a festival and every day of their lives. But the one thing we're going to be doing this festival next year, and after talking with them a lot, they told me that two years ago they did a festival. And so after talking with them, and they're great people, wonderful people, love God dearly, want people to be saved. I mean, I just love these people. They're incredible. But I asked them at the end, I said, you did a festival two years ago, right? And they said, yeah, there was an evangelist that came and helped us do a festival. So when I was in Portland, the Palau Festival, they, they knew this evangelist, and so we gave him a call. And we said, so what happened? I mean, we want to get back around these people a little bit that we're getting involved with. They said they're wonderful people, great people, love the Lord, want to get people saved, fantastic. And we did a festival, a five-day festival they did. Over five days, 100,000 people came. 100,000 people. I said, wow. He said, yeah, there was only one big problem. I said, what's that? He said, well, when they gave the invitation to accept Christ as Savior, 40,000 people came forward with their hands up. I said, why was that a problem? They be he said, because all these churches together had 100 counselors. I said, wow, 40,000 people want to accept Jesus, and there's only 100 counselors to pray for them, talk to them, getting involved in the local churches? He said, yeah. He said, we told them that they need to have lots of counselors because God's going to do some powerful things there because people are so hungry. They didn't believe us. They didn't believe God. So now they want to do another festival, and they said, we want you to train us so that all of our people understand their ministry of reconciliation. All of their people in all their churches can share the gospel. All the people in all their churches have a heart for non-believers to bring them to know Christ. That all their people become counselors at this festival. So next time they do it, if there's 40,000 people, they want as many as possible to come back to local church and be discipled. That's God's heart. God's heart. In 2 Peter, it says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing any to perish, but all come to repentance. God wants everybody to be saved, is what he's saying. Not everybody will, not be able to accept him, but God's heart is that nobody perish. Rock of Ages, you can go to the slide that has the poster on it. That's just a little plea, too. The next Wednesday, not this Wednesday, but next we're doing, and you probably got one of these, there's be a, a, a class that we'll be giving here about how to be a counselor. And not, to, and not only at the festival, how to be a counselor every day of your lives to people so you understand the gospel enough and are comfortable and confident enough in your own lives to share it with somebody every day of your life. Because that's our ministry. Praying for people. Praying for people to know Christ. I'll close with this little story. Can I just tell one little story still? about Billy Moore. And it's a true story because I met a guy up in Portland who met this guy. I thought his name was Andy, but it turns out his name is actually Billy Moore. Billy Moore was a guy who lived in Ohio and was kind of a derelict kind of guy. And he was a drunkard all the time, to drugs and stuff, a lot of thievery. I mean, he was just a gutter kind of guy. And one day he was sitting with a friend, and his friend said, hey, you know, he was another alcoholic friend of his, he said, I know a guy in our town, and I've heard that he doesn't trust banks, so he keeps all his money under his mattress. He's got a lot of money. So Billy found out the address, got his shotgun, went to the guy's house, and at gunpoint, robbed him of all his money. Well, the guy had a shotgun himself, 77-year-old guy. A little scuffle happened, and uh, Billy shot this guy dead. Took $5,600 from him left. Left town, but everybody knew Billy did it because everybody in town knew his reputation, so they caught him. So he sent him to jail, went to court, got the death penalty, so he's on death row. Billy's mother found two dear Christian friends in her church and said, we want you to go visit Billy every day and pray for him. He needs prayer desperately. So this couple went to his jail cell on death row and it takes years on death row before you're actually executed. And they prayed with him every day. And they said, Jesus wants 
to have purpose in your life. Jesus wants you to have no eternal life. Jesus wants you to have a second chance and, and do something with your life. He said, I'm on death row. What am I going to do? I'm dying. Who cares? He kept on arguing with him, arguing with him. After months, though, all of a sudden, Billy started breaking down and realized he needed the Jesus they were talking about. And so he asked Jesus into his life as the Lord and Savior. They found a, a bathtub, I guess, near death row, and they filled it with water. Billy wanted to be baptized, so they baptized him. Billy then started getting correspondence courses in the Bible and started bringing other people on death row to Christ, sharing with them. All these guys were coming to know Jesus. The reputation kind of spread, and so the warden of the prison, now this was in Georgia, went to prison in Georgia for some reason, the warden saw such a huge change in Billy that whenever he had problem inmates, he would send them to Billy for counseling. And Billy started getting all these prisoners coming to Christ, changing their lives. And pretty soon, people in town started knowing about the reputation. So if judges and courts had juveniles with problems, they would send them to death row to meet with Billy, and Billy would counsel them. This guy was changing lives like crazy. Excuse me, I'm a crier. I'm sorry. It came time where it was going to be like a couple months before his execution date. Well, all the people in town knew about Billy. Ward knew about Billy. I mean, everybody knew this guy is incredible what he's doing. God has rehabilitated him to the nth degree. For the first time in history, in the Georgia State Penitentiary, they pleaded with the governor and freed Billy from prison. Billy now is a pastor, associate pastor of a church in Illinois. Because of prayer, this man was changed and thousands of lives are changed. Billy is a testimony to what prayer can do. The other thing really quick in you, that we passed out of these things, and you can volunteer in the back for Rock of Ages, but a place here, there's five lines for you to pray for five people in your life that you want to either bring to festival or just know Jesus. Prayer is a powerful thing. Prayer does change things. The effective prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. Let's have a heart for God to pray to him, to plead with him, to cry out for him. The depth of reality of what that means is eternity. For us as saints and for people out in the world that don't know him. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for how you've dug into our lives, either because of prayer on our behalf or just because you, through your son Jesus, prayed for us so long ago, pleaded with you on our behalf. Our, our speech to you, our prayer to you is so powerful, God. We just thank you for just digging into our hearts, digging into our lives, helping us to see the reality that we have a union with you that's incredible. Help us to cry out, help us to beg, plead with you for the things that matter to you in your heart. Help us to have your heart, God, for others, to reach out through all the things we do, either this church or festivals or anything in the world, Father, things that we do to bring glory to yourself and also to bring other people to know that glory so they could share in that for eternity. And we thank you for the privilege of being that ambassador. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Yeah. Thank you, Ray. Good word. Thank you. God's been kind of putting it in my heart that, um, you know, we're, we're praying here on Tuesday nights now. If you, if you have prayer needs, there's prayer cards in the pews. Fill them out and, uh, and put them in the offering box, and we want to pray for you. But I have been feeling rather incomplete in many ways, and I'm not going to keep you long, but just in regards to prayer, that was something that needed to change in my life, and, and it has been changing, and I'm, and I'm feeling more like a Christian because I'm praying. And, and a non-praying Christian, I think, is an incomplete Christian. And a non-sharing Christian is an incomplete Christian. And Jesus told us to make disciples of all nations. So not a word of scolding, but a word of encouragement that we wouldn't be distracted by the world and so busy that we're letting circumstances define us. Jesus has defined us. So it's, it's a call for us, isn't it, to be what God has made us to be.
So uh, we have many opportunities coming up. Next week, uh, we have a, a visitor from the Billy Graham Association. We're going to be uh, involved with an effort that they're doing on television uh, in November. And so I'll be teaching most of it, but a lady from their organization will be here to share some ideas with you. And once again, it's about evangelism. It's about prayer. It's about reaching people. And so my heart's stirred, and I think uh, we as a church probably need to allow our hearts to be more stirred in this direction also. So once again, Ray, thank you. If you want to meet with Ray, if you want to sign up to help, everything from counseling. You know, we have a, we have a lot of uh, veterans here uh, that have known the Lord a long time. Sign up and talk to somebody that comes forward and pray with them and, and explain the gospel to them. Uh, sign up to serve with Pastor Gordon here, who oversees our kids' ministry. Sign up to pick up trash. <laughs> Bring someone. Be involved. It's a great opportunity for us. So, Ray, thank you once again. You'll be out in the foyer. God bless you guys. Have a tremendous day. Thank you. God bless you.